Launching payloads into space is no straightforward matter. Historically, rocket launches have been used as the proverbial swords into plowshares. Missiles designed to carry atomic warheads now send satellites and probes into the solar system. Ironically, it's one of the few exploits mankind undertakes that doesn't occur in nature. Rocket science is all it's cracked up to be. Bringing together the mathematical, engineering and mechanical skills required to design, build, test and successfully launch a rocket into space is a mammoth technical undertaking. So many countries and corporations have the capacity for launches nowadays that they appear commonplace. Zero. Only the keenest science geeks seem to watch them these days, unless, of course, something goes wrong, and then everyone is hooked. Space launchers fall within several categories, based on their payload or cargo weight and where it needs to get to. The unsung heroes are the commercial satellite delivery systems, providing light and medium lift capability to low Earth, polar or geosynchronous orbit. Many countries such as Argentina, Iran, North Korea and Ukraine boast their own homegrown systems. Even New Zealand, in a joint venture with the US, is developing a budget CubeSat launcher called Electron. The Soviet Union, first to harness its ballistic missiles, has several workhorses like the Proton rocket family, the Rokot, Zenit, Dnieper and sea-launched Volna systems. Ukraine, in its current form, inherited some of these rocket systems after the Soviet breakup. The Chinese Long March series of rockets has made steady progress and powers China's manned space program. Even they are becoming environmentally conscious as well. The Long March 5 heavy thrust cluster rocket with a loading capacity up to 25 tons is by far the largest carrier rocket China has. Compared with previous rockets, the biggest difference is the non-toxic propellant in hydrogen-oxygen engines and LOX kerosene engines that will not pollute the environment. And we applied serialization, unitization and modularization to design and manufacture.
Another major player in launch capability is the European Space Agency, ESA, with its facility at Kourou in French Guiana. The Vega launcher developed by ESA and the Italian Space Agency continues to operate for light payloads. The real European success story, however, is the Ariane 5 heavy lifter, the workhorse for ESA and the CNES. But it too will shortly be replaced by Ariane 6. Currently under development, it will use components in common with the new Vega C rocket. Ariane 6 will reduce the cost of, uh, of a launch service by 50% compared to today. So you have to realize that in, in just four years, we are reducing the cost of a launch service in Europe is 50%. And that is, of course, in a major step. And if you think about Ariane 6 in a double, double launch configuration, we are able to offer a price which is really, really attractive, also in comparison with the, comp the competition. So the, the, the situation that we will have with Ariane 6 and Vega C will be exactly the same in terms of what we can launch as we have today with uh, Vega, Ariane 5 and Soyuz. We can launch every satellite with these two launches in the future. It is very clear that the international competition is getting more and more intensive. This is very clear, especially from the American side, we can see that there is a, a systematic, uh, let me say, aggressive approach of the market to gain uh, market share uh, by American uh, suppliers of launch services. When NASA, intent on pursuing the Orion and SLS deep space system, relegated low Earth orbit to the private sector, the commercial floodgates were opened. The United Launch Alliance took over the existing NASA hardware and services and now operates the venerable Atlas V along with the Delta II and heavy lift Delta IV systems. It's now developing the Vulcan rocket for future expansion. Five, four, we have main engine ignition, two, one, and lift off, lift off of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket carrying the NROL-37 mission. The uh, Vulcan Centaur vehicle will be a high performance, lower cost, best value vehicle. We're going to maintain our mission success history that we've had with, with Atlas and Delta. So we've got uh, two main engine suppliers, Blue Origin with the BE-4, which is a natural gas-powered engine, and we've got the, the AR-1 uh, from Aerojet Rocketdyne, that is the uh, RP-1 configuration. Both of those teams are making, uh, making good progress. We've been through CDR with the Blue Origin engine, and we've been through PDR. They're both on, uh, on a plan to get to engine testing this year. They're both on a path to, uh, to support our uh, late 2019 launch date. With that mission now opened up to commercial ventures, many companies are rushing to build better, safer and, most importantly, cheaper rockets. Two private service suppliers for NASA are Orbital ATK and SpaceX. These are the first two contracted by NASA for current ISS resupply payloads and planned manned transfer missions. Orbital uses Minotaur rockets, which are in reality the MX Peacekeeper ICBM, which was never fully deployed as a result of disarmament treaties. Orbital has modified these rockets to carry scientific payload. Their heavy payload launcher is the Antares 230 and 232, which can lift 8,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit, including the Cygnus spacecraft. With the Falcon 9, Elon Musk's SpaceX company is working on the principle of recycling or reusing launch systems to make launches cost-effective. They can now return the main launch stage back to Earth and land it safely to be refurbished and ready to launch again.
They are now working on their heavy lift Falcon, which will be able to lift 54,000 kilos into orbit or 13,600 kilograms towards Mars and then return to the launch site for reuse. Sending humans into orbit is another matter altogether. Here, launchers have to be incredibly reliable and able to lift very heavy payloads safely. In other words, they have to be man-rated. The only two man-rated capsules at present are the Chinese Shenzhou and the Russian Soyuz TMA. Unsurprisingly, they look very alike. The Russians, however, are looking to the future and a crowded commercial market. Their Soyuz has successfully flown over 120 missions, but a new, cheaper capsule called Federation is underway. It will carry up to six cosmonauts and will be competing against NASA's commercial crew development program, which has Boeing and SpaceX delivering cargo and soon astronauts to low Earth orbit. Aerospace giant Boeing's space capsule, the CST-100 Starliner, is to ferry astronauts to and from the International Space Station. Starliner is go. When you're sitting in the capsule on top of a rocket Four, and the three, final moments of two, the countdown are happening, one. it's exciting. It's like being on the top of that roller coaster when you're a little bit scared, but you're really pumped because this is what you've been working for all your life, taking that next step into exploration. California-based SpaceX is developing its Dragon capsule to carry crew to low Earth orbit and beyond. The crewed version of Dragon would carry up to seven astronauts to the orbiting lab. Advances in aeronautical engine design have led to the Sabre. We're actually at Reaction Engines test site at B9. What is very significant about this is that we are in the process of testing a very, very important development in aerospace propulsion, which is a, a pre-cooler, a device for cooling the air, entering a high-speed engine, so that the engine can continue to operate pretty much as normal. This means that uh, we're going to be able to fly at speeds of Mach 5 pretty easily in the future. It is in effect a rocket engine burning hydrogen and oxygen. That in itself is not unusual, but whilst in the atmosphere the oxygen is taken from the air, cooled to liquid temperatures and fed directly into the combustion chamber, once outside the atmosphere, the engine resorts to the liquid oxygen carried on board, like a conventional rocket engine. Skylon will be powered by two Sabre engines and operate like a conventional aircraft capable of flying directly into orbit, transporting 15 tons of cargo into space and returning for a runway landing. We're looking at a revolution in transportation equivalent to the jet engine and uh, access to space, access to anywhere in the world within four hours is on the cards. Once you've got access to space on that basis, that's the stepping stone to anywhere in the universe and a very exciting future for the human race. Although government contracts are lucrative for these private companies, many firmly believe tourism is the way to fund future space development. For those cashed up civilian tourists, Space Adventures team has designed a circumlunar mission using a unique combination of existing and flight tested Russian technology. The combination of the Soyuz spacecraft and the lunar module will provide ample living space for your approximately six-day journey 
and the fuel required for you to leave low Earth orbit. Perhaps the most ambitious is Elon Musk's SpaceX interplanetary transport system, helping make humanity a multi-planet species. The initial design objective of the vehicle is to launch a variety of missions to Mars and other destinations in the beyond Earth orbit portion of the solar system. The large payload capacity of the launch vehicle, with the ability to place 300 tons into low Earth orbit, places it into the super heavy lift class. The ITS launch vehicle's first stage is designed to be reusable, following a return to the launch site and vertical landing after each launch. What's new on this vehicle is full reusability of even the second stage and the spacecraft as well. Cheap, safe space travel for all is just around the corner.